Shit. Hello everyone and welcome to the Darren Connell Podcast Show. Thank you for joining me this week. This week we've got my bold main man, Greg. Thank you for coming, mate. Thanks for having me, Darren. I mean, it's only cost us 900 quid, but <laughs> cash in an envelope, but... Exactly. It's not really, actually, because I just make you look like a dick there, didn't I? You know I'm a cash man. <laughs> Aye, and a brown envelope. What were you saying before the podcast started, that there's an island for sale? Yeah, I've been looking on the on the uh, on the internet. Somebody tweeted me the other day to say that there was an island for sale on the west coast called Little Ross, and uh, the price was three hundred twenty five thousand. And I looked at it and I was like, "That's a, that's that's got to be a that's got to be a purchase for somebody." Yes, somebody smart, somebody like yourself with a podcast. I think you could attract people from all over the world to come to the island. You know, I don't know. Wondering if it was the last podcast they would ever do. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> Come on in. I'm like, I still live with my dad, so I don't know if I can get there. I'll save up. My dad yeah. can move in as we get to. But three hundred twenty-five thousand pounds for your own island, you know, especially yes. with all this Brexit nonsense. You know, your own island, you could produce your own money. Yep. You know, you could have your own laws. I just thought there's something appealing about that. You know what I mean? Put a fence up. Who owns mm. it then? Is it just? It's privately owned at the minute. Uh, and I think you've got the Ministry of Defence just off the the water, kind of doing their their thing. But you you know you could oh. cut a wee deal with them and let them <laughs> do their. So you're sorted then for protection. <laughs> exercises on your island and all that. Twenty nine acres it is. For three hundred. Three hundred and twenty five thousand. God, that's like a house in the bricks. It's a lot of it's a lot of land for your buck for your for your for your buck. Yep. You know. No junk mail. No. No junk mail. How would you get a? Well, you'd have some somebody would have. To, to roll out your hate mail, wouldn't they? Hi, <laughs> Domino's might be deliver to an island. Two for one Tuesdays, mate. Yeah. If it's not here for 20 minutes, it's free. Exactly, you get it free every time. I want to congratulate you as well. Oh, um, everybody that? knows uh, still games coming back. Oh, thank you. But uh, you start filming on Monday, didn't you? We do indeed for six weeks, yeah. Six weeks and you were away. See, when you were away, was that nine years? Uh, seven years. Seven years? Seven years, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was actually seven years from when we stopped to when we did the hydro, but nine years, you're right, since till we did the television show. Yeah, 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 and did yeah. it feel that long, or did it go in quick? No, it, I mean, it, it, honestly, I mean, this is the scary thing. I'm 47 now, you know, and you blink and like a year goes by. It's ridiculous. It's always yeah. Valentine's Day. It's always somebody's birthday. It's always Christmas. The clock's kind of going like that. So it wasn't until we sat down after a, a, a big, long gap that we were like, that's been seven years. You know, it was I mean, ridiculous. It was. It, really it didn't was. feel like it either when it no. when it was away. No, no. Do you always get annoyed? No, annoyed. But do you get people annoying you? Like, when you coming back? Are you coming back? Game no. still game back. <laughs> people are great. I mean, we're really lucky. I mean, it's funny. You go through all sorts of different things, and there was a time when we weren't doing it. That Ford and I spoke about this, and it was annoying. But it wasn't annoying because people were annoying you. It was yeah. annoying because you realised you probably should be doing it. You know, ah. you should be making people happy, and yeah. yeah going to your work and all that and we were off doing other stuff and all that so from that point of view it was kind of like god they're right you know people yeah. are right we should be doing this uh but no it was great i mean th th the fact that they waited seven years for us to come back i mean that's a lifetime you know in television yeah. you know to come back i think uh to that welcome was was pretty special it was special but if it's good it's always going to be there it's timeless it's just like all the other kind of greats and if they come back mm -hmm. like it's not going to be much a difference, is it? Well, no, I suppose not. I mean, and when we came back and, you know, you, you put the cardigans on and the shirts and the ties and stuff, and by the way, it's very comfy. <laughs> you kind of were both looking forward to being that age. Um, it, it felt like even less time had passed, yeah. you know, and you start doing the voices at the read-through and everything, and you're like, oh, wow, you know, this is cool. Is it quite... Um, what's it like, like, see, doing the hydro? Mm -hmm. Is that... Must be... Because, see, when I first um, watched those guys, I had a DVD... And it was, I think it was live at Courtiers. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think I might have been about 13 or right. 14. Yeah. And I always, see, before I understood comedy, mm -hmm. I just thought you were old guys. <laughs> and I always remember it being hilarious. And then I never seen it until, I never seen you again until June of that. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the Hydro show and I was like, just, oh, that's my alarm clock. To see that kind of caught ears to hydro mm -hmm. within the space of 15, maybe yeah. 20 years, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like mental. Yeah. But yeah. it was unbelievable as well. Well, I, I know, and I guess a lot of people kind of forget that, that the show was a theatre show to begin with. You know, we started at the Edinburgh Festival in 1997, 
and um, we had about eight people in the audience, you know. Yeah. But we, we, we loved it, and th those that eight people grew into a, a full house over the course of the run for three weeks. It was a great summer, because we'd just come off the back of a show that hadn't quite worked, and we were both kind of like, oh, what are we going to do? So when we wrote that and did that, you know, even though the audiences were small, th the response was fantastic. You know, yeah. and it was a great summer. We had uh, Peter Kay one, so I think you're funny that year. We went to see him win it. We were in the audience oh, watching him. We're like my God, this guy looks like he's been doing it for 20 years. Never mind a newcomer, you know, he was amazing. Yeah. And uh, League of Gentlemen <clears throat> won the Perrier that year. And uh, that show kind of just burgeoned as well, you know. Awesome. So it has been a long time uh, since we started. But the live show is, is fun it's really fantastic taking those characters in front of an audience, you know. Yeah. Especially something that's been on TV for a, a good long while. Because, well, you know yourself, it's kind of, it's kind of hermetically sealed television, you know, you record it and then it goes and gets edited and then it gets shown to an audience much later, months later. It feels yeah. canned almost, yeah. you know, theatre is, uh, it's right there and, you know, if it's not working, you have to fix it, Aye. you know, and, you know, you do stand up. So, you know, you, that buzz, there's nothing like it, yeah. absolutely nothing like it, you know, to have 10,000 people there kind of shouting a ball and for you to come out uh, rather than get lost. I, <laughs> Which could have easily happened. Because <laughs> I mean, even sitting in the crowd, it's like see, see when they were waiting for you. I've never so many people were so quiet. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously that when you, they, when they were shouting, it was like unreal. But that just that calmness mm -hmm. before the mayhem. Yeah, I was like, I kind of the energy was mental. Yeah, like yeah, it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was but, great for us too. And, and it's like a loop because you you know the audience need to bring that energy and we need to bring it and then it yeah. feeds itself and it goes back and forth and it's it's wonderful. And you know what it's like you come off and sometimes you've had a mediocre experience or whatever and it's maybe it's probably your fault rather than yeah. the audience's because you've got to bring that energy you know yeah. and, and and power through it and, and create it. I really liked when, because uh, I went to see you a few times, but I really liked it when you were like copsing and giggling and stuff, because the crowd <laughs> loved that as well, and I yeah. think that was just a good mix of banter. Mm -hmm. But see, um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you actually won So You Think You're Funny, didn't you? Yes, yes. Rab we were, Christie. I won it with Rab Christie and a fellow called Neil Warhurst. We were a three-man comedy act called the Three Men Trio Brothers Troupe, wow. and uh, we were all at university still. That was probably that was 1990, and we came back that summer. And Neil, who's an English actor and uh, he likes writes a lot for radio, writes features and stuff, he said um, that Phil Kay, who was a student at uh, university with us, a colleague, Phil Kay's just won this competition called So You Think You're Funny, and we were like, what? That's brilliant! And he said, I think we should enter it, and we did. So we did. We entered it. And we won it the next year, and and so Phil was kind of like the guiding light to get us over to the festival. Yeah. And get us started, uh, and you know, then kind of stuff started to happen from then. Just well, more just getting the bug, for, you know, and getting the love for yeah. it, and being up in front of an audience, you know. And we used to write songs and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right? So, see, when you were in that final, how many gigs did you do together? Was that your first? It wasn't. Your we first had gig? done. I think we'd done a few. I can't remember. Rab would probably be able to tell you because he's, he's got the memory of an absolute elephant. You know, he's uh, he's got a fantastic memory. Um, I, I can't remember if it was about 20 or 30 or 10. I don't I couldn't tell you. But um, it was pretty early on. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. Maybe, maybe it was about, they'd been gigging for about six months or something around wow. pubs. We used to do Bonhams on Byers Road and they used to give us 60 <laughs> quid. And we'd go upstairs and it was rammed and you'd have to kind of fight through the crowd and do 20 minutes and fight for your life and try to be funny, you know. Uh, you had a big bucket of props and stuff like that. And you're like, they're going to hate us. But So You Think Funny was a great experience. Yeah. I can't uh, imagine... If anyone doesn't know who Rob Christie is, he's the producer of the comedy unit, well, head man. I can't picture him being on stage performing, he seems so quiet. And Good guitar player, Yeah. great at songs. And Rab, again, having the memory, I mean, myself, I was hopeless. He used to put the running order of the jokes on the guitar. Uh -huh. And we'd come to the end of a song and I'd go over and I'd go, what's next? And he'd hold his guitar up to show me. And I'd go, thanks. And away I'd go. And uh, I remember we went, Rab and I went to um, uh, or it was Orlando in 1994 for the World Cup with Bruce Morton. He was oh, with us yeah. as well. There was a, a group of boys went on a road trip for the World Cup in 1994. We watched Ireland versus Mexico and all these great teams watched Holland. Dennis Burkamp was playing. No, was he playing? I don't think he was because he didn't fly. And he couldn't get over, I don't think. Are you scared, don't he? He's scared, scared of flying, flying, yeah. So the point was that we were there for about a month and Rab uh, uh, basically kept this... He was going to keep a diary, but he ended up not bothering. He just kind of wrote down a couple of things about what happened today. And about a year later, he wrote up the whole road trip <laughs> from his memory. Right, man. And uh, I would ask him, what did we do on this day? And he was like, we did this and that. And I was like, that's freakish. Oh, yeah. You need to put that to use, man. 
Well, so right. maybe we'll see him on a game show or something soon. So that was 1990, I was three, three years old. The World Cup was 1994. Yeah, and Rab had a part in Braveheart, <laughs> and he was coming back from uh, uh, Orlando to do that. But unfortunately, something happened, and they they recast his part, and it was Sandy Nelson. Oh, I so Sandy he played Nelson. the brother of William Wallace in the opening scene and the young scene. And I remember Rab being annoyed at that. Not annoyed, but just kind of like, oh, what an opportunity that was. But yeah, anybody would be. Because quite every, quite a lot of famous Scottish people were in that, weren't they? Yeah. Even just as I wouldn't say extras, but. You see them? Who was his name? Uh, oh no, man! What's his name? Give me a clue. Grey hair. Grey. <laughs> Is it me? <laughs> Ter- <laughs> he directed. Um, t- Is it Tyrannosaur? T- oh yeah, Peter Mullen. Peter Mullen was yeah, he in that? He was in that. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And Dave Mackay and uh, oh god, there's tons, tons, tons. A lot of Irish actors too. Wasn't there like a proper blipper in Braveheart though? Like it shows you somebody on a mobile phone or something? Or there's something about a hat? There's like, quite a few I think. There's yeah. quite, I think sort of, if you go back before the digital era, you can see any website will show you 50 bloopers from most movies. And there's <laughs> one point when Mel Gibson's running across the field and he's got an axe. And then in the next shot, he's got a, a <laughs> stick with a, a ball and a chain. Uh, and then it goes back to the axe. But the action's so fantastic that you don't even notice. And plus, that's not that bad, but I think I've seen, like, Lord of the Rings, like, Frodo's got a pair of trainers on and stuff. You're like, right, come on. <laughs> that's right. He's cutting through a field with a pair of cap. Frodo's on, he's on WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> Just get a haircut, like a buzz cut. Yeah. So, um, see, have you actually done regular stand-up? Have you ever done just, like... Stand up. I did it once. Yeah. I did it once at the thirteenth note. Oh, right. I, I, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would be kind. I would, uh, if I said that it was, it went well. It was, it was a very modest gig. Right. Yeah. It was a, it was a gig of two halves. It started really well. I remember oh, right. it going really well. And I actually, at Ford was in the audience. He'll testify to this. And Bruce Morton was there too. And I remember them turning their backs about eight or nine minutes in because it was starting to go badly. Yeah. And uh, it was a hammock gig, is what it was, Darren. It started well and it ended. Well. I know, I know the, I know the <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> And and I remember them turning back in the last four or five minutes. But I came off and I was like, "That's crazy! Why would anybody do that for a living? That's terrifying." God knows how Frankie Boyle and you know Kevin Bridges and all that can do that filling stadiums, because it's a lonely existence and it's hard. And you know, you know, if you're doing a play, you've got set designers, you've got directors, you've got lighting guys, you've got your fellow actors, you've got your script and your costume, you've got so many things to hide behind. Yeah. And with stand-up, they're their own writers, they're their own men, you know, they yeah. get themselves to the gigs. It's just them. It's, that's what makes it, makes me, I'm, I'm more of a team player. Yeah. Even when I did live stuff, it was me and two other guys. Uh-huh. I'm very comfortable being on stage with other people. I wasn't comfortable doing it by myself. It wasn't for me. Yeah. I think um, I've kind of experienced that as well. Mm. Like the camaraderie uh, being in a sketch or something, mm-hmm. and then you go back to stand up and you're like, oh, Inverness on a Tuesday night <laughs> myself. Yeah. I'd rather be chilling with like Karen and all that. Yeah, and it's that hour or two hours when you're cutting about before yeah. you go to the gig where you just, and you know, you, stand ups have great imaginations, they have to. So you imagine the worst and you imagine terrible things, and you're standing in Sainsbury's <laughs> or wherever it is trying to, you know, buy in a, I don't know, a Kit Kat. Ah, <laughs> shite yourself. Can we swear on this, by the way? Aye, of course. Groovy. Get your tap out. That's as bad as it gets with me, by the way. I'm groovy. so square. Shiting yourself. All right. Ooh. Groovy. <laughs> I know. I do say groovy. It's Bruce Campbell says groovy, and so that is pretty cool. Those saying groovy. Yeah. Like well, you're bringing it back. Bruce Campbell's the king of cool, isn't he? Do you yes. know Bruce, Bruce Campbell from Evil Dead? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, oh, I'm getting mixed up there, Bruce. Is Bruce Army Campbell. Of Darkness. Army of Darkness. I've got. Is there a comedian called Bruce Campbell as well? Oh, perhaps. Alan perhaps. Campbell, maybe. Right, Aye, but right. Bruce Campbell's cool as fuck. He is. You're a big horror fan, aren't you? Huge yeah. horror fan, yeah. Huge. So you're pretty sad with the George Romero news? Yeah, that was pretty sad, yeah. I, I, I think these guys almost don't get their um, the credit. That they're, well, they do from certain, you know, people like Edgar Wright and stuff and people who love those types of movies, you know, give them their place uh, and, and do it very eloquently. Yeah. But I think sort of a lot of the film community are kind of like, oh, that, you know, I don't know, it's kind of... But to guys like us, you know, yeah. I think that the, those kind of guys passing is a big deal. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, is, did he essentially invent that genre? Well, I, th- I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and I said, oh, yeah, he invented the zombies. And, and, so, and I can't remember who it was. was like, no, there was a zombie movie in 1932. And, 
And uh, so I don't know if it's an invention or whether it was a kind of... I'm not even... I read an interview the other day that said that he, when he made um, Night of the Living Dead at 68, he said he didn't even call them zombies no, in the middle. No, you're right. That's right. They, they, no until Dawn of the Dead that became no. zombies. Yeah, so it was like a retrofit going on there. Yeah. You know, but what a cool thing to... Yeah, it's cool, man. And I kind of blasted him towards the, the end as well because his last couple... Like, what was it, Diary of the Dead, I think? Mm -hmm. It was the mm -hmm. mobile phone footage. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is shit, but you can't take away what he achieved, like, yeah. back in the day. Well, it must be hard, I guess, because I guess he was one of those directors in some way. He must have had so many stories to tell, like anybody would be. Yeah. It was, it's good. If you're going to spend two or three years of your life getting a movie made, you're going to be filled up with stories. And what, and that those are the movies that he made, you yeah. know what I mean? And that's probably a, a, a blessing and a curse, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Well, I know that um, obviously you've done your comedy, and you've you've done the dark comedy. Would you ever actually make a horror, like a genuine uh, yeah, non-comedy horror? I would love to do that. I would love to do that. And um, I, I'm working on a thing with my pal Donnie McCreary uh, to that end to to do a feature horror. Um, Set on an island in Scotland, but the thing is—is is it that one that's for sale? <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go there and rent it for research, and then, and then be killed on it. Aye, and have my bones it picked at. Um, no, we'd love to do that, and I think I think the, the challenge for us is actually trying to pull back from the the urge to put jokes in. Yeah, you know, you can make funny characters. If you look at Jaws. You know, I've watched Jaws easily over 70 times from start to finish. Yeah. And sometimes I put it on and it seems like a comedy to me. And I don't mean that to sound disparaging. What I mean is the scary bits I've seen so many times that they no longer scare me. Yeah. But there's so much great comedy in it. There's Carl Gottlieb did a draft of the script and punched all the, up all the comedy. Like, and they improvised things and uh, you know, Richard Dreyfuss crushes the polystyrene cup. There's some amazing comedy in that film, yeah. you know what I mean? And so the characters are so alive and fantastic. So I'd like to make a... I'd love to have a stab at making a movie like that that was serious, with serious consequences, but the characters were delightful, you know. That'd be great. I would love to see you do something like that. I mean, obviously, love your comedy, but... I would love for you to see me, to see you. Yeah? Nah. Can I be in it? Yeah, I'd love to have you in it. I'd love to have you in it. <laughs> you get that one. I was saying that to Jordan Young last, uh, last week as well, where I was just looking at the comments and all these people are like, can I be in River City? <laughs> And Jordan's like, uh, aye, it's that fucking easy. Just right. come along, come along aye. on Tuesday. Just turn up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aye. No, but I hope, I hope you do that, man. Well, Shortly GFT, cool. it'll be nice and cool. And yeah, good. yeah. Well, well, I think horror is one of the one genres that <clears throat> can benefit and actually be better for having a low budget. You know, you mm -hmm. can't do a science fiction. You can actually do a, a low budget science fiction. You can, of course, you can. But those things, you know, the, the, the less you see in horror, it leaves a lot to the imagination. So the, the, shark, the story of the shark not working and Jaws and Spielberg having to become inventive and yeah. come up with the barrels or the bit, the pier that turns around and chases the fisherman back to the beach. All of those things were done because the shark wasn't working, you know. Which I didn't is, know that. Yeah, which is pure genius, that. you know. The biggest scare, the reshoot. Yeah. The, the, the bit That's where right. they go down and they fucking find ah, the, yeah. the teeth. And the, it's the biggest scare in the film, the fucking shark in it. Yeah, that's it's amazing. Right. Ben man. Gardner's boat. That's the one, right? That's right. And the story goes, so we're just going to talk about Jaws. Oh, there you go. Huh? Just, uh, he, the story goes that Spielberg watched the movie and he had a graph for where all the big screens Aye. were. You read that? Aye. And uh, there was a is gap. That, it's actually in the, the making of Jaws. The, is it the Jaws log? Right. Yeah, that's that's a great book, by the way, the Jaws log. Um, and he had a gap of about eight or nine minutes where he didn't have a scare. And so they went and filmed, I think it was in the editor's swimming pool or something, that's the story. They filmed the Ben Gardner scene where the head pops out the side of the boat and uh, and Richard Dreyfuss is trying to get the tooth out and then the, the head comes and he drops the tooth. That's freaky, isn't that? <laughs> it? was great. Oh, that's amazing, cool, man. man. Amazing. Yeah, was cool. that the... Many Jaws, is there? Was Fuck. Four. Yeah. Well, Jaws of Revenge is the last day, so... Jaws 2, Jaws 3D, then Jaws of Revenge. Jaws 3D. I saw Jaws 3D in the cinema when I was a kid. Really? We snuck in. I saw Jaws when Very I was sweet. six years old. You know, remember in the old days when the movies used to be, they used to come out for like a year or a year and a half? So Jaws came out in 75 and I saw it in 76 in Maine. And it was a drive-in and there was about eight people in the car. And I was six years old or something like that. And I fell asleep and woke up just to see Robert Shaw get bit and all the blood come piling out his mouth. And my Aunt Frances was supposed to cover my eyes, but she had forgot. I was, I was asleep, so she was watching the movie. And I woke up and seen poor old Quint getting hit. Oh. And I was like, ah! You, you're not a bit young for that? Well, you were in a car. Well, I was in a car, so uh, you could just drive in. And yeah. there, was, there wasn't really anybody checking, you know? Main, is that? That rings a bell. Well, it's not far where they from where they filmed it. Yeah. They filmed it in Martha's Vineyard. 
Is that Stephen King? Does he use that quite a lot? Yeah, that's, that's right. Castle Rock is yeah. like a kind of. Well, he lives in Maine. Ah, right. Banger, yeah. Maine, I think. Uh, Dairy Maine's where that is. Yeah. All right. And he's got a house with uh, uh, gates and, and bats and stuff like that on it. You know what he's I mean? He's a cool guy. I love the idea of him kind of embracing his kind of. Oh, well, I'd live in that White House, by the way, and write, yeah. write shit. Yeah. Well, do you remember in uh, in the film The Fog, John Carpenter's The Fog? Yes. Um, Adrian Barbeau has a lighthouse and she has a radio station from that. And that's kind of, that would be my dream. Would would, that, would you not love That'd that? That would be cool, man. You know, broadcasting that, to the world from a lighthouse. That's why I always say when people say Bobby, it's like I worked in Asda as a trolley boy for 10 years to become Bobby. <laughs> Just like De Niro really, would have. <laughs> really you know sad I mean? life. <laughs> um, so whereabouts, in, where is Maine? Is that America? Maine is on the East Coast, yeah. Yes. It's just, I think it's just up or just near, it's just before New York. So if you come down from Canada, you come through Maine to get yeah. to New York. And you're Canadian? Yeah. yeah. So does that freak a lot of people out? It does, it really freaks people out. Yeah. And it kind of upsets me that it freaks them out because there's airplanes <laughs> and boats and people travel yeah. around. But people genuinely get taken aback when they, they hear my accent. They're like... Yeah. They actually think that I've, I've moved to America and, and become American and put it on. Yeah, and like I, you've become a dick. Yeah, <laughs> like I've become, oh man, you've become a dick, that's a shame. But they don't say that, what they'll say is, oh, your voice is really posh. Nah, you know, which is, Craig used to come from Mary Hill, nah, he used to be one of those. said to you, is that a Craig Lang accent? There you go, you see, <laughs> yeah, an accent. Really In fact, I, I did a documentary a few years ago, for, uh, it was about, about Scottish film, the history of Scottish film, and I can tell whenever it's on the TV, because I'll start getting slagged on Twitter. People are like, who the fuck's Greg Hempel for? Who the fucking Mickey Moose accent's that, man? You know? That's way more than a sheet, by the way. It starts coming up on the Twitter feed like, oh, they must be showing the, the Scotland on film documentary. Uh, years ago, when I was watching uh, the live floor show, oh, yeah. were presenting it, yeah. and I remember having a good five minutes, I was like, what? Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. That's how I thought you were a stand-up. Like years ago, I thought you were a stand-up. Ah, yeah, yeah. Because you were uh, compare. That was a great fun show. I did two seasons of that, with, and, and Frankie Boyle was on that, and, and Miles Jupp, and uh, it was it was loads. Of, actually, it was Daryl O'Brien that took over from me when it, when it went onto the network. I was doing still games, so but yeah. I wasn't able to do it. But uh, I loved doing that, you know, and it was great. And being in the writers' room with those guys, and they would sort of pitch in for the monologue and stuff like that. It was such yeah. good fun. You felt like an American you felt like Craig Ferguson or something or Letterman Aye. you know what I mean Aye, it's cool. and, uh, it was good fun really good fun because I was kind of so young and I never really understood like I seen the Reverend Obadiah oh yeah and I was oh, just like great. is that guy an actual preacher I thought for a couple of years yeah he was he terrifying was as well as he was like terrifying as, as he was hilarious you know <laughs> I'll tell you on the uh, speaking of um, you remember talking before we came on about uh, Nirvana and stuff but uh when I, when I did the live floor show, Ian Brown came on it. And now, to give you an idea, I like Elvis and I like the Bee Gees and the Beach Boys. I'm such a square when it comes to music. It's not that these aren't great musicians. Yeah. But, you know, I'm old school. I got my musical taste from my parents and stuff, you know. That's a good taste, though. Well, it's, it's not bad, is it? Yeah. I mean, it's not bad. The king, you know what I mean? It's the king. But um, uh, Ian Brown came on and I came home. My wife was at Spike Island. Yeah, uh, she was there, and she's the biggest Stone Roses fan. And uh, she was going to come down that night, and I said, "Oh," she said, "Who's on?" I went, "I don't know." And she said, oh, "No, I'll just stay. I'll just stay." And I got home, and she went, "Who was the musical?" <laughs> she's only just started speaking to me again now. I was like, "Ian Brown." She was like, "Fucking what? <laughs> Fucking Ian Brown?" <laughs> I was like, "What? What?" <laughs> she loves him. She likes him. Ah, yeah. She likes him a lot. <laughs> if she knows, she's probably seen him since though. Yes, we've been to see the Stone Roses about four times. Because uh, you're shaking yourself. You're like yeah, I just keep, every time they come out, I buy a ticket, <laughs> and I try, you know. And uh, do you like the Stone Roses and stuff? I love them. Yeah, I love them. I went to the gig at Hamden there a few weeks ago, and uh, the crowd were quite pissed up, you know. Oh really? And so you're a wee bit. I mean, you're like, whoa, whoa, you know. But the, yeah, it was great. The, the atmosphere was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think he was kind of singing along with the crowd to his, his ah, own track. It. it was kind of weird. But no, they're what a band. But Jules, my wife, is the is the she's the massive. She's the one that got me into them. Good. You know, she's she's, she's got the Wi Fi just cut there. Did it? Oh really? It's that's her back. My back. That's her back. She um, we're talking about the Stone Roses just in case you you lost it in the electrical storm. It's a beautiful night. <laughs> um, <laughs> up, it's up in the lighthouse. Well, no even filming it. It's just 
Just leave him plugged in. Just slit my throat now. I shut the door, Andy. Aye, snuff movie. Take his shoes off. I'll sell them on eBay. <laughs> My wife has got the musical taste. She's got the musical taste. Yeah, yeah she's, she's, a, she's a great rock fan. Could, could you say to um, people that maybe don't know who your wife is? Mm. Julie, my wife Julie, is. Uh, she, uh, we, we've been working together for years and then we got together after we did a TV show and she went on to do Balamori. She plays Miss Hooley in Balamori. Yep. She did do over 10 years ago. Aye. And uh, it's a long time, you know, that she's not been doing it. And sometimes we're going for a walk in the park in Kelvin Road Park or something. <laughs> and this guy, about six foot four, will walk up and be like, Miss And Jules will be like, yes. <laughs> She'll be like, I was in the nursery. I was oh, a wee boy. boy in the nursery. You know, that happens. And Jules will stand and get her phone. <laughs> this giant, you know what I mean? Six foot four. Bottom like a brick chat house. Yeah, Cheers. yeah. I love Barrow Boys. Right. I was wee Gaza. Do you mind me? You know? That's brilliant. <laughs> I never realised it was 10 years ago because yeah. I thought it would be quite like if you were walking down the street, kids would be like totally. Oh. <laughs> no, they still do. They, wanna, they wonder where her lampshade hair is and her green cardigan and stuff. But she loved doing that show and, and I thought it was a great show. I remember when she was going up for it, you know, they. She showed me the proposal and I was like, God, that's fantastic, you know, that's so cool. Yeah. It felt like a kind of Scottish Sesame Street without without puppets. That, that, you know, aye. It felt like a kind of aye, it just aye. felt so warm and kinda of, and uh, and Miles Jupp, of course, was, was in that show. Yeah. You know? Um, a Scottish Sesame Street would be pretty cool. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it would be like Avenue Q though? You'd have to swear in it, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah. It'd be more like Ted, a Scottish kinda of, It'd be everyone would be depressed and Yeah. Yeah, you got a flag, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oscar the Grouch would be a good Scottish <laughs> living in a yeah. A, a Scottish Muppet show would be awesome. They just uh, fired. Uh, did you see that on the internet the last couple of days? They fired Disney fired the guy who did the voice for Kermit the Frog, who took I, over from Jim Henson. He was mm-hmm. at Jim Henson's deathbed, and he took over from Kermit the Frog. Yeah. Done it for twenty seven years, and they they canned the poor guy. Ditched like that because mm. they were saying he was uh, his attitude was wrong or something like that. But mm. he was saying it was creative difference differences maybe I think there's a lot of uh, Muppets whose attitude is wrong that I would have put above Kermit's aye. you know what I mean That's Miss Piggy sad. for a start aye she's a coward her attitude is wrong isn't it aye. 27 <laughs> years he's been doing that for 21 or 27 years 27 yeah wow. yeah man yeah. so Frank Oz it does Miss Piggy Emmett yeah Frank aye. Oz that's right um, and she, do you know Siobhan Sinnott, the, 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 the film reviewer? She works at BBC Scotland. I think she reviews for the papers now. She uh, she interviewed Frank Oz, and uh, I, I, mem- I remember meeting her in the street and going, how was, how was it to interview Frank Oz? It was the freakiest thing. She says, you're sitting there, and Miss Piggy's on his lap, and you talk to Frank Oz, and the pub's like, what are you looking at him for? Look at me! And it's, you just find yourself drawn towards it. You, find it. you could not look at Frank Oz. You had to look at the pig. Aye. I thought that was really cool. Plus, if you've been doing it for that long, it'd be like being in a jail for 30 years or something. <laughs> They'd just become that character. Like, was yeah. that Anthony Hopkins film with the... Magic! Oh, Aye, magic. Yeah. yeah. That was cool. I've not seen that in a long time, because yeah, you know wow. you were saying we like horror. Uh, Noddy, the director, Noddy Davidson, the director yep. of Scott Squad, He's been coming to my basement now for 15 years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a couple of others, uh, Paul Greenwood, who reviewed, used to review for the Evening Times. Why? And uh, Sanjay Cole used to come, Rad Christie used to come. And we watched ba- horror movies every Sunday night for, you know, for easily for 10 years. We do it a little bit less frequently now because we've all got kids and stuff. Uh, two horror movies a night, uh, every Sunday night. So we've watched movies from all over the world. And we haven't seen Magic for a l- I don't think we've seen that. And we ca- I can't get them to watch The Exorcist. Why? Because Noddy's too scared to watch it. <laughs> and this is horror night. No, I don't want to watch that. Too. And, and he's like, oh, don't really. But actually, he's, he's hit on a good point. And he says, The Exorcist is, he says it's, it's very grim. And it's, it's not like watching Drag Me to Hell, which is fun. Yeah. So there's a good question there about what makes a great horror film. Is it fun and is it entertaining? Yeah. Or is it, should it, the more horrific it is, the better horror film it is. The best psychological film ever made. And it's in my top five, The Exorcist. Without doubt, I've watched everything they do. I watched Mark Kermode do the the full documentary. I've been like, oh Jesus Christ, there's so much yeah. in that film, it's fucking unbelievable. That, has that not had a bad write up recently? People saying it's quite cheesy and all that kind of stuff. I watched that a couple of years ago for the first time and I was Joe like, that's fucking 19... William Friedkin fucking fired a gun at the, 
Father and Men, no, no merits, uh, Jason Nightmare played the young priest. He actually fired a fucking gun to get a reaction off him. Mm -hmm. So and that's, and that's a reaction, he's listening to the tape. You watch it. And he shot a gun. And he was going to No, imagine getting a fucking gun fired in your phone, a fucking phone, you know what I mean? Nah, he's like, getting like equity pay. What, what, Madness. What's for lunch? What's going what's to be lunch <laughs> on the catering? <laughs> Right, go, act, cry. Peace and Gavin. <laughs> Peace and Gavin. <laughs> William, please put that down. <laughs> William. That thing, this is no fucking blunt, man. He's probably fucking shot uh, fucking some cut <laughs> in the back of the screen, you know what I mean? The guy with the boom. He's <laughs> <laughs> just throwing right. like that. <laughs> was Get that, the boom operator. Was that in 1977? 73. 73, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you some random information about that, um, if you might not know it. Uh, the director was a massive Marx Brothers fan. I love the Marx Brothers. Do like, you? Obsessed. And supposedly he wanted to get Groucho as the priest, right, the yeah. actual main priest, mm -hmm. but he was too sick. Oh, really? Groucho was too sick because he was old. Do you know, I think this is probably, there should be a lot more, this is going to sound like a flip comment and I genuinely don't mean it, a lot more comedy cro a horror crossover, I think. You know, you, It always stuns me when you see Mel Brooks' name come up at the beginning of The Elephant Man. You know, he produced Mel Brooks, it. Mel right. Brooks produced it. And he produced The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. You remember that movie? Yeah, yeah. Brooks Films. And I was like, that ah, Brooks Films. I wonder if I said it with Mel Brooks. And it was Mel Brooks' uh, phone company. Yeah. And I think there's a there's a good there's a good correlation between comedy and horror, you know, the way you set up yeah. a joke and then deliver a punchline. It's the same as setting up the suspense before you deliver a kill, isn't it? Sam Raimi has yeah. fucking has influences of the three stooges. Yeah. <laughs> well absolutely <laughs> he's there, there, is, there is bits where fucking and Aye. Evil Dead with ashes up with the fucking language. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I'm just laughing at Will's voice. It's like people have not seen what he looks like yet. Well, have you not had him on camera yet? Well, well, well I was on your podcast. Right, right. It's just like you, you know what I see, my fucking mug, you're all right. <laughs> uh, you sound like a ten foot brickie, but you're like. <laughs> as a dwarf. Uh, no, I'm a hard cunt, you mean we say that, man. A ten foot brickie. <laughs> <laughs> like Paul Bunyan. Right. <laughs> I get heckled. By dwarfs at my Edinburgh Festival show. <laughs> I what? don't know why I told you that. Actual dwarfs? Yeah. Really? Um, they were giving us a tough time at them. What, like, was it? <laughs> my show was a. Really? What, like, was a, a gang of them in? There was a gang of dwarfs at my, my show. Really? Well, I swear to God. I was get For some reason, they made my show a 14 plus. I don't know why they done that. Because I know you've not seen me do stand up, but it's pretty dark. Like so I had to apologise to somebody's dad and I was because there was a wee guy sitting there and I was like, Oh I thought the wee guy was a midget and when I said midget the whole room just went silent and I was like oh, right, What? Right. And I was like <laughs> Is there a midget here? And then all I heard was I were dwarfs. I was like, Oh no <laughs> It's actually dwarfs. I find that offensive. There you go. Yeah. And then I had to buy like a round of paints for <laughs> The wharfs after the gig and stuff. Like Four pints. That's what I pint. say. <laughs> <laughs> but their feet were dangling off the seat and stuff. That was quite funny. So you thought they were kids? Aye. Hmm. But I was like. And then you got a mouthful. Aye. And how did you handle the What did they, What kind of were they? Were they? Were they did you? Did the room chill? Well, they did. I mean, it kind of. He's like, ah, it's actually the wharfs, and I just said, "Fuck off." <laughs> <laughs> and then I got a laugh. And then I shook his hand after it and he had like a proper gorilla grip. And I was like, wow, man, that is like superhuman dwarf strength. I'm digging myself into a hole here. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just pay you off the ticket? Please, they weren't, they weren't, um, it wasn't the cast of Lord of the Rings, was it? <laughs> I imagine with that. A, with a grip, with, with the Gimli. Hobbit feet. Gimli, I love that. I love those movies. I love those movies. We used to, we were, we're, uh, Paul Riley is really good friends with Billy Boyd. Uh, who played Pippin in yeah, the Lord yeah. of the Rings and when we were starting out doing Chewing the Fat Billy was away in New Zealand making those movies I think Paul actually went to visit him and he used to come back and we'd give us the stories man what's, what's going on because that was they were making that at the same time as they were making the new Star Wars prequels and all that and they were making those three movies back to back All like it was like one big movie that they were then splitting into yeah. three that's the way it was kind of told over 18 months or something and the stories we'd get from Billy and we ended up having Billy in Still Game actually and we'd all just sit around and be grilling him on, you know, on, on Peter Jackson and, and, and the whole experience because you know it's like it's kind of entered lore now Lord of the Rings but at the time it was like seen as a huge risk yeah. you know but he seemed to have the time of his life I think he was 
he was either learning how to surf or he could surf by then, but he was going all over the world surfing. That's amazing, isn't it? You know what I mean? I, I ended up gigging with him round about. I never realised he was in a band. And then I gigged with him in the courtyard. And it was like kind of the height of his fame. And it was just everybody's like, there's that guy for Lord of the Rings, just chilling right. in a band. And it yeah. was like so cool. He was so, he was so nice as well. Yeah, that's right. He plays in a band too. Yeah, yeah. I don't is, know where he lives now. I think he might be out in Los Angeles. Is he still in a band? I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. Are you ever out the band? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> is he is he turned into a dick? Is he like a vegan and all that now? And... Oh, I can't. No, I can't imagine. Billy's a grand guy. Billy's a <laughs> I'm always kidding. Always is, is he that turned into a dick? Yeah, dick. <laughs> Tweet on that. He'll make you a dick. <laughs> No, he's a good guy. I only said that because he's a good guy. I remember That's talking great. to him that night. It was a good laugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, see Peter Jackson, did he uh, did he do Brain Dead and stuff? Yeah, he started out in horror, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. That's a bit weird, isn't it? Doing Brain Dead, then jumping to Lord of the Rings. It's not really horror, but Brain Dead. It's, I don't know, man. I thought it was. That's a good bit of fucking tongue in cheek, name. What was the movie he did before he did Lord of the Rings? It was a kind of it was Frighteners. It was after Frighteners. It was a no, I think F- Frighteners was before Lord of the Rings, wasn't it? Right. Mike, it was Michael J. Fox. And then he done the one, uh, the wee lassie dies. Heavenly Creatures? No. No. Um, the only one, something like that. Was this one where Kate Winslet hits the girl with a brick? <laughs> no. I'm sure. I'm I don't know one. why I laughed at that then. We're going to have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to look, we're, so I know it's the least Kate Winslet thing to do, isn't Aye. it? Aye. It's know? just a weird sentence of Kate Winslet. I th- I th- I'm sure it was called he- no it wasn't called he- what's Heavenly Creatures then I can't even mind look up Heavenly Creatures big man also Andy have you getting any questions uh, just people uh, someone John Mc- McClellan said he met you t- twice once in the toilet and once at Celtic Park I remember the first time in the toilet but I don't remember at Celtic Park John <laughs> I said he was uh, surprised I'll never forget that time in the toilet <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry Andy Heavenly Creatures 94. 94. So the Frighteners was after that. Was it? Okay. Um, what, what was that fella's name? John McClellan. John McClellan. Met me in the toilet. Met me in the toilet. Yeah, right. Met me at Celtic Park. You're doing a pee and he's like, all right, mate. I used to go to Celtic Park quite a lot. I've not been... The last game I went to see Celtic play... No, that's not true, actually. I've been to a couple since then, but f- for a long time, for about seven, eight years, I didn't go. And it was the night Henrik Larson came back was playing for Barcelona and he scored against Celtic and I remember thinking this sucks man <laughs> Hendrik you bastard so you're a good Tim then I, no, I, a I, good I'm Celtic a, boy I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a football fan I love following Scotland yeah. I like to follow Celtic but I don't really go to that many games anymore I like to watch from home I'm, I'm 47 now I like to have a can of beer and sit at home nothing and shout wrong. at the telly you know what I mean nothing wrong with that yeah uh, but I supported. I, I sound like one of these fair weather fans. I used to go watch Thistle quite a lot. With Rab, uh, with Rab and Noddy, yeah. we used to go and see a lot of the. I used to travel about and see the Jags. Uh, Rab will tell you a great story about shouting. At a, a, he was down. Uh, shout, he shouted. He went to see Queen of the South against Thistle one time, and he was down at the front of the. Uh, the and he shouted at the goalie. Yeah, yeah, cut goalie. <laughs> And the goalie turned to him and went, I got a cut last Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't get that at Ibrox at Park Lane. No, <laughs> the goalie talking back to you. <laughs> and hearing it, but being able to hear. <laughs> well, where did you get it cut, mate? That's right. <laughs> Much was it? Looks good. Was that Kenny Arthur, probably? <laughs> so have you ever had any, I mean, obviously this is just tongue, tongue in cheek, you don't need to go into proper details, but like, if you get any mad fans at, like uh, I said to Jordan last week, you had any mad like death threats? You ever had a death threat? We we, we, I, we didn't I had something that felt like a death threat actually. It wasn't a literal death threat, but we were Ford and I went into a pub one time, and uh, we stood at the bar and uh, we ordered some drinks, and there was a guy like that. You two bastards be cheering for that? And we were like, yeah. And he went, come down and cheer if that and fucking Gordon, <laughs> or something like that. And we were like. And just forget those beers. <laughs> aye, aye. And, and, when, and uh, I can honestly count on one hand the number of bad experiences we've had with, with folk. People have been amazing. We've been really lucky. Uh, taxi drivers always like to chip in and give you a t- And actually, this oh, is... You know, you, but you have to go back. We're, we're talking pre... Kind of pre... When everybody had the internet, mm-hmm. you know, and you could just read and see what characters people liked and what people don't. 
and it can be pretty brutal, you know what I mean? It's like being in rollerball, you know what I mean? <laughs> when you're going online, it's a bad idea. But in those days, we wanted to get feedback from folk, and we'd ask taxi drivers, well, what characters did you like, what ones didn't you like, and you could really get a feel for which one, because they'll just tell you, you know yeah. what I mean? It's great. They, they, they wouldn't, there'd be no standing on ceremony. Aye. There's no diplomacy. It's like, that character was shite. That one was great. No, whatever. And uh, you could sort of amass a kind of database of what was working and what wasn't. That brutal honesty. Look at Scotch, Scotch Squad's pish. I'm like, ah, cheers. <laughs> cheers, mate. Or Cop Squad there. Cop Squad! Cop Squad! Cop Squad! Cop Squad! You need to get your cell phone out, it's still game. <laughs> Do you get that with Scott? No. <laughs> All the time. But I like that when people get the name of things wrong. You know, it's like you've, you know you've become like a dad or a kind of 50 year old man when you get the name of it. Where are the pictures at the weekend there? I've seen that searching for Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> I was really t- t- the grand wings, you know. Magic. <laughs> Aye. Cop squad. 50 quid. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever just get right? You, you know what you should do? You get yourself on that inner deal, which fucking <laughs> brilliant that. Hey, you'd, be bro- you'd be good on that, by the way. <laughs> Like you're just supposed to just pack a little bag with a handkerchief and poke out a handkerchief and head down to Emmerdale and just, I've been told to get on Emmerdale. <laughs> or they tell you a joke and then they go on to tell you the most racist, homophobic joke and you're like, I can't really use that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to get at the taxi now. Well, they'll say, or they'll, say to you, they'll tell you something that isn't really a joke, it's just a story. And then they'll go, better not say that in your show, in your programmes. <laughs> better not say that in your programmes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, you, sometimes you get that but uh, but you know uh, I was talking to Noddy in, in the basement of my house a couple of weeks ago and he told me something that happened uh, in a five-a-side match and I went home and wrote I, I said I'm stealing that and I wrote it up and we put it into still game for this season so uh, so you, you know when you hear something good if you you know if it's if it's there's no copyright on it you go I'm having that Aye, that's going right in my set geez it geez it I definitely you know so you're looking forward to it? I really am, Darren. I'm really looking forward to it. Series 8. Um, uh, we've got some cool uh, guest stars coming this time. Uh, not that guest stars are taking over the show, you understand. It's still the kind of core characters. We've got Method on Mick hopefully coming back. Good. Um, Scott Reed. Love Scott Reed. Love yes. Scott Reed. Um, and I love his character too. And it's kind of really kind of... I don't know, it's kind of given a different angle to the show yeah, and all that, having a young guy there, it's been great. Um, and everybody gets on so well now, you know, the read-through, we had the read-throughs, everybody just kind of slips into their characters, you know, and it's kind of funny, you close your eyes and it's like being on set, you know, and it's fun, and everybody's really comfortable. And I guess it's nice to have been doing something that's been embraced for as long as that, yeah, you know definitely. what I mean? It's great. So what about, um, would you ever do a film, a still game movie? We've been asked this a couple of times, and I think Ford and I would probably say no because uh, it's you know we've, we started in the theatre and it's on TV, and you know people pay a lot of money to come and see us at the Hydro, you know, and you want to make sure they put on a good show. Yeah, it would feel like a bit of a liberty making them come to the cinema to see Still Game because they get it for free on the TV. Well, it's yeah. not for free; you pay your license fee, and you you know, but. You know, to do to do a film, I don't know. Does people want to see Craig Lang in a film? It'd be like on the buses or something. You know what I mean? It'd be it'd be shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Yeah. Brown the movie. I haven't seen that. Oh, I've not seen that. It's a car crash I think. One. I think. Uh, <laughs> a car, is there a car crash in it? Well, that's a fucking. It's a ninety minute car crash moment. Well, listen. There's a lot of sitcoms that have. I mean, you know, I haven't seen the In Between Us movies, but you know, you look at the box office. Kids love those things. Some things work going from sitcom to film. Yeah. If there's a young demographic, yeah. a lot of things struggle. Sitcoms struggle as films because they're sitcoms. Yeah, because part, Alan Part, I mean, I love Alan Partridge, but his film was a bit of a. You're like, oh. I mean, it was good, but. Yeah. I think you build something up too big. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. There's always the pressure of the writer to sort of have a a, a foreigner with a twiddly moustache come yeah. in to the film and, you know what I mean, and be up to no good, a nefarious character. Whereas in the sitcom, it's kind of like kitchen sink stuff, it's going to the pub and it's all that. And You yeah. always sense that with the film, there has to be the raising of the stakes. Well, if you're doing a film, it'll need to be a horrible one then. Uh, horrible, hor- yeah, where everybody just dies. <laughs> right. this is a, maybe we'll bring... Bring, bring back Big Innes and he could just knock us, kill us all. Drink a bottle of Maduri and kill us all like a serial killer. Aye, like a like Jason. <laughs> <laughs> See, just on the subject to that, Alison Wright here is asking how long is the writing process? How long does it take you to write a, an episode? 
Uh, well, we started this series. We started. Uh, thank you for that question. We started uh, in in March the first, and we finished uh, end of June. Um, yeah, so that was three months. March, April, May, June, four months, and that includes rewrites and it includes all that. that what, what no, that's all six. That's all, that's six, all right. six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we sort of we, we basically only we only write one at a time, which I know sounds daft, but we you know we don't sort of plan six stories and then write them. We just yeah. plan one story and write it. And then as we're writing that, we start to get ideas about the next one. And so it's, yeah. it's a bit like the penguin and Wallace and Gromit putting the track down like that as the train goes over the... <laughs> do you know what I mean? You should really I, build the track first, yeah. Darren. <laughs> I really liked how um, in the newer ones, how there was more... I mean, it's comedy, but there was... Like, see when like, the bar, Bobby the barman was buying the homeless guy, like, breakfast. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow, man, I actually quite found... Not upsetting, but... I was just like, it's really nice mm. we break from comedy and that's such a... Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I loved that. That was my, uh, my whole part of the new stuff. Mm -hmm. I'd say that was my favourite bit. Oh, that's cool. Um, I guess with, with those characters, and, and Gavin Mitchell, who plays Bobby the Barman, he's one of the most fantastically lovely, warm guys. We almost feel bad because he slag Bobby all the time. The characters slag Bobby, so when you're writing it, it's, it's, Gavin is so not Bobby. <laughs> you know, he's like... But... Uh, I guess what Ford and I like to do is, you know, if you had two characters who just slagged one other character all the time, you'd, you'd, you'd start to think, well, that's, there's nothing like that that's real because that's not real life. You know what I mean? You wouldn't hang yeah. around with somebody who fucking slagged you all the time. No. Mind you, you three guys seem to sort of... That's <laughs> 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 um, But so the, what we like to do is say, well, there must be times when Bobby or Jack or Victor are, are soft and, and the, the, yeah. the moments are warmer. And those, you know, you want to put those in as well because they're just as rewarding as the jokes, I think. Definitely, man. Uh, I, mean. shed, I shed a tear. Oh, dude. I did. Did you? You're going to shed a couple of tears in this series then. Good. Series 8. There's a couple of heart, heart string moments. I'm not going to say too much about it because obviously we've just had the read through and I'll get in trouble. I don't. If do. I say too much. But no, there's a, there's a couple of good, um, nice wee... See what I would ask you? Does the writing get what, richer? Is the more you go and... As you say, you can get away with being a comedy for so long and then bring some kind of dramatic stuff in it. Does that make your writing a wee bit more? I can bring that in now. I think. Do you know what I mean? I think. We, we, I mean, we. You know, eight years. And I can say this. We got. I think there's only one episode we ever wrote where we got halfway through it and we we're like, "Fuck, it's not working. It's, we're stuck," and we just kind of stuck it in a drawer. We've always felt like when we start the story that we know where it's going to end and we're prepared to go anywhere. We'll go anywhere with it. You know, even if it's not a laugh for two or three pages, if there's something that needs to be said, then you just say it, you know. Mm -hmm. There was one other episode that we wrote early on where my uh, son comes to visit me, and when we cut it all together, we watched it, and the second half of it was like fucking EastEnders or something. There wasn't a laugh in it. It was really, really grim and kind of yeah. like, you know, I was like, get out my house and all this. <laughs> and they, and uh, the producers were like, we're just not quite sure. And we were like, right, we can fix this. We've gone too far that way, you know. It wasn't like EastEnders. So you go back and you fix it and stuff mm -hmm. like that, because you're always trying to have a balance. Even yeah. when it's emotional, you're trying to get to something that you know it's uh, a bit more gentle you pull it back with a laugh or whatever like that right. Right? because that's your very good one the one at the Frank McCallum one the 60 year anniversary one oh yeah, so yeah the yeah. writing and that's fucking phenomenal man oh, I just, thanks man I actually watched it last night again I've seen it I, fuck, I don't know how many times yeah. and every time it just gets you you know that, that wee twist at the end and all that's fucking great man <laughs> so as, and it's obviously doing the writing uh, it's fucking we love man. a twist Right. You should release you a, a really nice. dark episode just as a piss take. Yeah. Just really dark. Like How are we dying and all that. Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's uh, asking here about a, a prequel. A prequel? Mm -hmm. Good. That's, that's a good, good idea actually. Eh? Well, we, we, did, we did an episode where they got stuck in a lift and uh, we went back to the 70s to see them having a, a hug and a. And I think, because um, we've, we've often thought, we kick, you these ideas, we, we kick these ideas around all the time, you know, could you do a spin-off, could you do this, could you do that, a prequel. They did a prequel for Only Fools and Horses, and it was like young Rock and chips. actors Aye. playing the, what was it called? Was it Rock and, Rock and, Rock and chips. chips? And I think the problem with those kind of things is that Jack and Victor and all their pals are funny because of the age they're at. Yeah. And if you take away their age, you kind of, take away their it's like Samson cutting the hair you know what I mean yeah. he's taking their superpower away yeah. they? I'm not sure how well they you know I, I don't know yeah, and plus they love that version of Jack and Victor they don't want like your mm. Jack and Victor they mm. don't want like Only Fools and Horses is 
Del Boy into it, they don't want to see him. We've went for a good idea, a shite idea. Aye, basically, can I be in the prequel? Well, no, because, you know, <laughs> hey, listen, man. I can play two characters like Tom Hardy and <laughs> <laughs> What was that? It was the craze. I haven't seen that, the craze. Is it good? It's Tom Hardy. All right. it's, it's all right. Yeah. It's watchable. It's one of the craze good and the other one's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> I want to that Tom Hardy's great, guy. but the other Tom Hardy lets him down badly. <laughs> He's carrying that Tom Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like it, it became too much about Tom, Ca- uh, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy being two characters in the actual film. Right. So it was just kind of watching him. It was the Tom Hardy show. But it was still good. Do you know what's a good two character film with one actor in it? That's a that's a really clumsy genre, isn't <laughs> Double it? Double impact. Yeah. What was that? Double impact. Double impact? Van Damme. Van Damme. Not bad, okay. <laughs> Not bad. You've raised the stakes. I'm gonna see if I'm gonna might come over it might come on. Jeremy Irons. Dead Ringers. Dead that's Ringers. Like David Cronenberg. That's two surgeons, one two, is there both surgeons or one of them's a surgeon? Uh, both yeah, surgeons. Surgeon brothers, and one of them starts to go a little bit crazy Dead Ringers it was made in the mid 80s nice. really good I haven't seen that oh it's ter- it's really terrifying I, oh. the only one I've seen where like one actor being numerous characters is like uh, the clumps <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Eddie Murphy Eddie Murphy he's no stranger to a fat suit that guy is he oh, he fucking loves a fat suit I know what's he all about he rips the ass a bit though doesn't he yeah, like, I... too many characters in the yeah. one yeah, well, I think that's... Yeah, he sort of kind of decided to get into kids' movies after that, didn't he? Because he was kind of like the clumps were like... He was everybody, wasn't he? He was probably, he was probably holding the boom as well and <laughs> turning the camera in a big fat suit. I imagine him on the set, man. He'd be a pure... You're like, oh, mate, come on. I bet you he's a vegan. I bet he's a vegan. <laughs> he's one a dick. Any more questions? Um, Kevin Scullion's asking, what are your favourite sketches or memories from Train the Fat? I tweeted a sketch the other night, which kind of um, uh, I, I love it, and 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 we, I remember I can remember writing it with Ford so clearly, and it was the sketch where the ice cream van pulls up, and it's Karen's in the ice cream van, and there's two wee boys who are probably now in their twenties, uh, and uh, she says, "What you want? What's your wee pal wanting?" And he, he whispers like that, and she says, he says he's wanting a scratch at your fanny, and uh, she she pulls up her skirt. But you don't see her doing this; you just yeah. see her beginning to pull her skirt up, and then you cut to see the boy. And um, I kind of loved that sketch because it kind of really kind of made a kind of boom for us. It was just kind of like, oh, my God, did you see that last night? And, you know, we handed it in. And we were like, let's hand this in and see if they'll let us do this. And we talked about all the nuances of it and said, you know, obviously it wouldn't work if the guy in the van was was a guy. And it was too good. You wouldn't, you'd never write that. But there's, it seemed funny that these two guys were getting shut, shut up by a woman who was basically kind of just in charge. And so we thought, no, she's the one in power here and it's cool yeah. and it's risky, but we're going to put it in. And they were like, Ewan was like, yeah, let's try this. So there was, Chewing the Fat was great fun for that kind of thing, you know, because sketch shows, we used to film 45 minutes for 30 minutes and it was great. You know, Colin yeah. Gilbert used to say, the more darts you throw at the board, the more times you hit the bullseye, you know. So you never filmed 30 minutes for 30 minutes of broadcast because you had to be able to be experimental and try weird shit out and stuff and and not be afraid to let things fail and, and that was a, the way to make a great show I think you know to yeah. just try stuff and then leave out the rubbish you know and and so there were so many sketches that were, we thought were quite risky at, at the time and and we were really well supported because it was just it was BBC Scotland uh, it was it started out in the middle of the summer it was just on, in, on Radio Scotland in the summer after the shinty you know and you was like do you know <laughs> it's fine do what you want so that was cool you know yeah. being able to kind of do what you want I kind of miss that yeah. S- sketch writing is great fun, you know. And I mean, I take it you've been asked, would you ever bring Tune the Fat back? We have been asked, and I think the problem now is, you know, Ford's 53, I think, or 54. I'm 47. I don't know what the fuck we'd look like in shell suits, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> Stealing a telly off of somebody, you know. I think we'd look a bit ridiculous, our bellies hanging out, barely fucking legs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Going like that. Hey! You know what I mean? With our comb overs. <laughs> Never mind, we used to have dagger fringes and now we've got fucking comb overs. Hey, man. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, I don't know. It would be fun, I guess. You know. ah, it'd be it's, fun. It's a 20th anniversary coming up, so you never know. Fucking I dude. remember my Uncle Deck. My Uncle Deck's a painter. And see, every time the paint, ste- the paint sketch came on, yeah. he would tell me all the time, he's like, that's the way we fucking talk. <laughs> he's like, this is like watching me in my fucking work, man. He knows honestly, the documentary. Right? Honestly, that's, that's exactly what he's going to fucking paint us, doing me a team. <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. 
<laughs> no, we had great fun on that. And Robert, of course, Robert Florence and Ian Connell, they wrote for that. Yeah. Uh, Sanjeev Coley, Donnie McCleary, uh, Noddy, Rab, myself and Ford, and t- tons of others wrote for that. Brilliant, man. Because I, I know um, I was watching, I'm a big wrestling fan as well. Oh, man. And I was watching your YouTube stuff the other night about see the wee kind of argument you had with Robert Florence yeah. on uh, BBC mm-hmm. News. Mm-hmm. I've watched it a hundred times, but there's just this wee passing comment that you said. You're like, Robert's <laughs> lost... Ro- Ro- Robert used to be really fat and he's lost all this weight. And I was like, this fucking amazing man. What a <laughs> what a beef. Like, that was just... That wee throwaway comment was just... <laughs> Had me in stitches. <laughs> we had such fun doing that, man. You know, and I don't like to say too much about it because we're kayfabe. You know what I mean? We still needle each other when anybody asks us about wrestling because we've got to keep the kayfabe going. You know what I mean? And, uh, and we had such a good time. And we went on that show and we said to the, the, the presenter, um, she said, "What are you going to do?" And we said, "Oh, it's best if you don't know." And she was like, "Okay." Yeah. And she didn't have a clue. <laughs> she said, Not a clue. And then you know, so when when I threw the water on him, she just jumped out of her seat yeah. and me and Robert came off and we were completely buzzing like oh, that was magic that was so magic oh, was he's a massive wrestling fan you know and and uh, and he, there's a member he's got some members of his family who are professional wrestlers yeah. uh, you know he's he's loved it since he was a kid same as myself yes. um, same as yourself you loved it since you were a kid um, I, I was obsessed with it when I, I mean when I was younger I'm more old school wrestling like I love British Bulldog Bret Hart Owen Hart and yeah. re- recently it's only kind of like uh, Fit Finlay, William Regal. Yeah. So I'm not like, and then CM Punk was my favourite, but he's disappeared. Yeah, he's gone. So, I hope he comes back because I absolutely loved him. Yeah. And Robert really likes, uh, is it Heart- who's the Heartbreak Kid? It's uh, Shawn Michaels. Yeah, Mr. WrestleMania. Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels. Some wrestling fan, I can't remember from Shawn Michaels. <laughs> Mr. Heartbreak Kid, that's you. Hey, Mr. Go. Heartbreak Kid, searching for Nemo. Hey, Mr. 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 <laughs> Hey, ah, Mr. Suplex, he was cool. He does all that sweet chin music, no? Hey, the sweet chin melodies he does. <laughs> Aye. Um, he made me cry, Shawn Michaels once. Really? He bet the British Bulldog for a championship match at SummerSlam, and I wept. Really? Yep, because the British Bulldog was my hero. Oh. And I was like, Shawn Michaels, you bastard, man. <laughs> Absolute bastard. And then he... Flung him at the, the Royal Rumble, have you seen that one? And then he pulls yeah, back in yeah. and he chucks him off the top rope. Had me greeting again, man. I was right? like, I can't believe it. Oh, See man. the fact that he's never won a championship, yeah. that hurt me. And then he's passed away. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's horrible. It's, it's so many of them have died young, it's an absolute tragedy, you know. It's But, you know, a lot of these... Old schoolers, you know, they had tough lives and, and tough schedules, and yeah. uh, and they and they medicated and, and dealt with it accordingly. I guess yeah. uh, it's a tough, tough existence, you know. And I've spoke to a few guys who, who who've done it, and uh, you know, you're on the road for you know three hundred. It's not like football where they, they get eight weeks off in the summer or whatever, uh-huh. or American football where the season lasts twelve weeks. The season's yeah. all year round, and they're on the road constantly away from their families. It's tough. I tell you, uh, years ago when I was getting into it, this is one of the, one of the moments when I became obsessed with it. I'll tell you the moment I became obsessed with it. Uh, there was two things that happened. The first one was, I'd seen a, a, a Battle Royale, and uh, this is how long ago this was, by the way. Bruno San Martino was in it. Wow. And the Iron Sheik. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Bruno San Martino threw the Iron Sheik out, and the Iron Sheik had a stick, and he was beaten. And I was like, oh my God. And we were right at the front, you know? And when the th- whole show finished, the, it was the Montreal Forum, everybody was filing out, 20,000 wrestling fans. I got separated from my group, and I went to this door and I went through it and I was backstage. I was actually, I walked in and I seen the Iron Sheik with his arm around Bruno Sarantino and the two of them were decking it and laughing and going, ah. Wow, man. And I was like, because oh I was still at the age where I was like, you know, is it, what's the deal? Yeah. You know, what's the deal? And it was like a peek behind the curtain. It was magic. And then about a month later, I was crossing the road uh, and uh, Mr. Fuji was getting out of a taxi. Wow. And me and my pals, I don't know what age we were, 12 or 13. He was he was paying for his taxi and he was laughing with the taxi driver and he looked across and he seen but four kids coming across to, to say hello to him and he grabbed his cane and he turned and just went straight into character. He was like, hey, get out of here! <laughs> and chased us back across the street and we were like, ah, oh, it's Mr. Fu-. And I just kind of like, I kind of get emotional when I think about that, you know, because it was like a little, again, I saw him being nice to that guy but he was horrible to us. It was so cool. 
to a kid. And the fact that he's went into character, yeah. that's such a nice thing to do. It's And it's so like, old school, isn't yeah. it? It's just, I love the Is old that school the, the old guy with the white hair? He was Andy Kaufman's manager for a while. Mr. Fuji? Yeah. Mr. Fuji, I think he, he looked like Odd Job from uh, Doctor <laughs> Was it not Doctor No? Was it Goldfinger? Yeah. He had the bowler hat. And he used to throw salt at people's faces. <laughs> oh my God, he was from he was from a Hawaiian wrestling family, I think. You know, a fantastic Hawaiian. You know, most of these guys are second, third generation wrestlers. Who's uh, your favourite wrestler? Uh, Bret Hart. Bret Hart. Bret Hart. Bret oh really? Yeah, oh my oh, God. Oh my God, yeah, mate. I, don't I think I love you. Oh, break your heart. I break your damn heart. I, yeah, yeah, I yeah. love you, mate. I know oh. I, Brett, and Robert, I, I, Robert, that was that's why Robert and I used to follow because he loved, he loved uh, Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels and I loved Bret Hart and then of course you got the Montreal screw job and all that. Oh, uh, you know, in my hometown by the way, Montreal. Were uh, you there? I was not there. No, I, I was living over here by then. You know, but um, no, Bret Hart. I, I just loved him and, and he, he made it look so eloquent and so. Yes. He's an artist. He's a storyteller and he's an athlete. Yeah. You know, he's all of those things. And he, they are the best. That is the best. John, I see when Owen, without sounding grim, but see when Owen Hart passed away, I was kind of falling away from wrestling. Yeah. And I walked in, and my brother, honestly, was like, eh, I think you should probably sit down. And I was like, why? And he's like, I've got something to tell you. And it was like a, fa- like a death in the family when he told us, because I was like obsessed. Yeah. With, like, it was British Bulldog, Brett, then Owen. And I was just like, I can't believe this, man. And... I stopped watching wrestling for a couple of years. Took a break that. from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was yeah. like, I can't handle this, man. I, I, you know, much. you know, last year there was all these poor celebrities were dying. It was like the song. You know what I mean? It was unbelievable. Yeah. But I, I, you know, and it, it means a lot and stuff. But you, for a lot of people, you, you have to, you, you have a connection to, to people on the, on the TV or in film. And yeah. for me, it was those wrestlers. So when when Macho Man died, I was weeping, and my wife was yeah. like, "What's the matter with you?" And I was like, Ooh. "And the same, you know." Um, with the Piper, you know, uh, so you know, and and they, I don't know. I just I, I watched them so much when I was a kid, you know. And when they went, I was just like, oh my god, yeah. you know. And you selfishly, you're thinking about your own age and you getting old as well, and how much these people were part of your own childhood yeah. and how important they were. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess that's what it is. It's how how important. Yeah, because all that. I had a really nice moment with uh, see the bulldog's wife. She follows me. I, I didn't say right that way. I have pumped her. Uh, no, uh, no uh, for some weird reason, she follows me on Twitter. Does she? And uh, a couple of years ago, I, I tweeted her and said, I was like, ah, it's just, I don't even care that I'm fanboying here. Like, I don't care. My childhood was like the Heart Foundation and Davy mm-hmm. Boy Smith. Mm-hmm. They gave me so much in my life. I just want to tell you that I appreciate that. And mm-hmm. I love like what your family's done and I hope like all the best. And she actually got back to us and I was like, oh, oh my God, man, this is amazing. First time in my life, I was rain, actually so buzzing. What? Oh my God, it started raining. <laughs> Jesus. Um, we, should go, we should go to Calgary and see um, Bret Hart's house. Can you do that? I think I think that the the the, the city have made it a, a monument, or they've oh, made right. it a place of historic significance. You know, like the blue plaques we have over here. Yes. Whatever the Canadians' version of that is, a red plaque or a maple syrup plaque. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but, but He's we, not going to come with his gaffer. Right? <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Cover my house. Wait, you're getting here again, man. Beat it. <laughs> I think we should go and see it because he's got the dungeon oh, there, right? So yeah. you know the, about the dungeon. Uh, uh, Stu Hart had the the basement converted into a wrestling ring, right, yeah. and all these famous wrestlers. I think um, uh, who's the who's the who's the great guy with the jacket at the moment with the spiky hair? He's in a band. Cuts about Jericho. Jericho. I think he trained in the dungeon. I think a lot of Canadian wrestlers trained there, and I think that's you know for a wrestling fan that to me would be like going to Graceland. Yes. But for a music fan, I definitely I'd go, man. That is uh, unbelievable. Well, oh, you've, you've read got his a book? good taste. Read his book? No, I haven't. I've read got it. his book. Read it. You'll I've... love it. I... I Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no. No, you no I did, I did. Sorry, I'm just getting excited because we're talking about the Brett. Everybody else is like, who the fuck's Brett Hart? <laughs> they tell you as I'm buzzing it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you something right now. If you, if you, if any of your viewers are saying who the fuck's Bret Hart, they can fucking turn off right now. Unlike you don't, age. you don't want those viewers. Everybody when they were younger. I mean, I wanted to be a wrestler right up until I was fourteen or something. Yeah. Then I just realised I was a fat slug. And 
think I'll go down the entertainment route. <laughs> Listen, there are look. There's George the Animal. Steel. There are places for fat slugs in there. Are you comparing me to George the <laughs> no, Animal? No, I'm not. But I'm saying that don't don't ever ever put limits on yourself and say I won't be arrested because of this. You can do whatever you want. Thank you very much. Even now, because I, I never thought I could do a wrestling match, and I did. And you've done very well. Thank you. I'm not being that sounded really. Condescend to no, me. You actually don't know anything. <laughs> you can condescend to me when it comes to this and all you want because I, I, I know how it went down. I know how it went down. It could have been better. I could have pinned them straight. Yeah. But I was kind of, you know, I was a bit dazzled and knocked out and stuff like that. <laughs> and I was dragged by Red Lightning on top and put over Robert Florence's carcass. Did you yeah. do the training? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, it's the sorest thing in the world. Hard, isn't it? That ring is like, this is the thing they don't tell you. You know, those wrestlers, they're doing it every night. I, I have nothing but admiration for them. That ring is like concrete. You land on it and you're like, oh my God, Jesus Christ, I've got to get up and do that again. Aye. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's, unbelievable. Hard, it's hard going, man. Those ICW boys, what a respect for them. I did the training for eight weeks and I was fucked. Any more questions? How long have we done, by the way? That's an hour and five. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Fuck's sake. Can I just say, by the way, that feels like it's been about 15 seconds that we've been talking. <laughs> Somebody just, they were saying the, the, the Love and Still game and Dan... And from America, so... Oh, hi. It's probably Wicked. like my fucked cousin. Uh, hi, Lorna. All right, Lorna. Whereabouts <laughs> in America is Lorna? Uh, she's not just said America. She's just said America. Here's a question for John Toner. Who in Still Game is the most like their character in real life? Tough one. See, I could get I could get Mark Cox in trouble here and say it was him. He's like Tom, but I wouldn't... I'm, I'm not... <laughs> I wouldn't do that to him. No, I would say the person most like their character is probably uh, Jane. Jane. Jane is most <laughs> she like her character. Like she, I've, when my, Julie and Jane have known each other as long as I've known Jane, and uh, when those two start talking, it's just like forget it. You know what I mean? You could, you could, you could what power a rocket to the sun. Oh, maybe what are these? What are these? It's a surprise. You know, I'm starting filming on Monday, and I'm not trying to eat any of this kind Please, of shit. Eat it for me. <laughs> You wake up in a field. Can I smell it? <laughs> I wake up in a field. Were your ass burst? What's that weird smell coming off that damn? Cosby treats. I'll turn up at the set on Monday like, I am it, I'm, 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 I've, repl I've replaced the place. Oh my. <laughs> Jesus, eh? Christ on a bike, they're good. I'm like, I'm like, um, I'm, this is like a sweetie version of uh, Dennis Hopper in Blue Velvet, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Have they're, one and you'll be like me. No, they're great. They're great. Sorry. Thornton's, baby. I just chucked that in front of your face, man. Sorry. What's inside them? Tell me. Heaven. Talk to me. <laughs> Talk to me. What's inside uh, them? Rehypno? <laughs> no. <laughs> Toffee cake bites. Right. That's a really shite advert, isn't it? Toffee cake bites. <laughs> <laughs> so normally we wrap up at about an hour. Mm. Um, unless you want to get the guitar out or something I thought it was a gong <laughs> it's real didn't it I, I, yeah it's not the corner man. Um, I'm easy any way you want to do things it's your show I'm just here and I'm at your gaff your manner that's very kind you know, of you so you know that's I'm kind. beholden to you my friend if you want to play us out with a tune please do I wish I could I wish I actually could mm. I was a five and found a uh, found a French found a music <laughs> so I could probably play odd Ode to Joy. I can't even talk, man. I'm having a stroke. Ode to Joy on the guitar? Yeah. E E F G G F E D. That's off go. Fantastic. Five years. <laughs> I got sugars just up here. Five years. Any more questions before we wrap it up? People saying hiya. Hiya. Jane. Hiya. Alex Robertson. Hiya. Hi, Alex. Oh, what a rush. Hi. What they were talking oh, about. Hello, Bernie. They were talking about being the double actors, so I married an axe murderer. Oh yeah, Michael Myers, Mike Mike Myers. Michael Myers was the killer from Halloween. Canadian boy or not? Canadian, that's right. I, I've heard, I don't know if this is true, but I read somewhere that Mike Myers and Jim Carrey lived streets away from each right. other in, uh, it's a, it's, I think it was Mississauga or somewhere like that, somewhere near Toronto. Somewhere near Toronto. Mm -hmm. One of my comedy idols, I love him, John Candy. I love John Candy. Also oh, Canadian. Right. Yes, also Canadian. John Candy is great in yeah. uh, Plain Strains and Automobiles is probably one of my top ten films of all time. I absolutely love it. Honestly? Love it. Aye. Brett the Hitman Hart and Trains Planes and Automobiles, I think we've just became besties. We are besties, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we were. 
I remember when yeah. he passed away as well. Before, I know Kennedy, this yeah. is 1994, I believe. Yeah, when he was making a movie, a uh, western, wasn't he? Yes, and that was like, you know how you get those kind of, I'm sure you think that way, Elvis, mm-hmm. like they're that famous, they feel like family. Yeah. As you're saying Canadian bacon in the background there. No, but like, cool. what was it? The phone. Oh, man. That way, he didn't die on Canadian bacon. He died on, it was called Wagons. East? East. Wagons East. Ah. Wagons East. That's the one he died on. It was a western. Because I think Canadian Bacon, they finished it and he's in it all the way through it. <laughs> Which means he could have died. Right, we're going to fucking finishing line in the post production here, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> I'm just being, I'm just being Pete Pedantic there. You're fucking Pete Pedantic, you're right. fucking, you're right, Jay. <laughs> yeah, Canadian bacon. And so I don't know what it was, to be honest with you, it's one of the two anyway. We'll call that a draw. No. It's not one, it's not one of those two, it's Wagons East, I'm not going to tell you again. That's Wagons East. Food side, you're fired. <laughs> You get you calling it a draw with your Canadian bacon bullshit. Well, before we wrap it up, I want to wish you all the best for Monday, mate. Everybody's buzzing. Thank you, Darren. I'm buzzing too. I'm excited, and uh, I wish you all the best with this show. This this is fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. And obviously, you can come on anytime you want. I'd love to. I'll be surprised if you do. Really? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm not invited. Right. Just walk in. All right, Dan. <laughs> I've got two tickets to Bret Hart's. <laughs> uh, no, but you're more than welcome. That is appreciated. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Great talking to you. Um, have you got anything else coming up apart from this old game that you would maybe like to... Uh, we're working on a... Th- I did a thing last year, uh, a horror thing called West Garlite. So we're, we're hoping to do another one of them in that vein. Um, so uh, we're working on that at the moment and uh, we shall wait and see how that goes. Good man. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, and that's appreciated, mate. Fist pump. See you later, everybody.